Thank you so much. I'm going to try something here. They wired me up, so maybe I can actually walk around and speak, to, which is kind of a different concept. We usually have to stand at our desk and do that. So, you're cutting through. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. I'm going to try to turn that one off so I don't get a bunch of back questions. Great. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. I was going to introduce my wife and my pledge director, but um, that was taken care of for me. And I really appreciate that. I want to thank Nancy and, and all of you folks for, for coming out this evening. And, um, just have a conversation about what's happened in, in our state and in Sacramento and in the district, quite frankly. It's been a, a you know, quick, fast learning curve uh, down in Sacramento. So I, I want to impress you with a few things that really will make a difference in, in Sacramento. And the one thing is that we're in a super minority. The Republican Party is in a super minority, which makes it very difficult to do anything. We need to pick up three seats in the assembly, and we need to pick up, I think it's two in the Senate, to, to get to the two-thirds threshold. It would be great to have more than, than that, but that would be the minimum. And why I say that is because if, if every single Republican that was is elected in the Assembly votes against a bill, and it's a two-thirds bill, it still gets out of the Assembly. You only need 41 votes to get a bill out. So by saying that, I mean, they have a lot of extra votes there that um, we quite frankly don't have. So if I, I want to start out with just saying something that I think is very important to California, which is to get us out of a super minority. And I want to talk a little bit about, real quick, about how we can do that, and then I'm going to get into all kinds of stuff. And, and more than that, I'm going to want to listen to you, because that's what my job is to do. But um, we had an opportunity with a special election, Andy Bidak, who is in the Central Valley, and he went up against, it was a, a almost 20 point, a Democrat seat, and we won that seat um, and put a Republican office. Megan and I and my family went down in July and actually walked precincts in 116 degree weather. <laughs> but I tell you, that's what it takes. It takes boots on the ground, it takes a grassroots, it takes money, but it takes a commitment to get out the vote and to make sure that the votes that are there are counted correctly. And we did all those things. I want to back up for a second and talk about uh, the last election cycle that I have to go through it. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what I see as, a, as a, an issue for Republicans. We take a lot of, we spend a lot of resources and a lot of time battling Republicans in Republican districts. And I say that, this is a, this is a Republican district that I represent. But I ran, as you guys all remember, I ran against another Republican in well, a Republican and a Democrat, an independent, and a Green guy to start out. And it ended up to be two Republicans in the race. So you, no matter what, we knew we were going to get a Republican out of this district. There was about a million and a half dollars spent. Well, actually, in three districts where there were Republicans on Republicans, we spent like three million dollars in the state. We lost a seat, the Fox seat, by 145 votes. We didn't spend any money in that seat. We thought that was a safe Republican seat. So those, those things, and I know that that was talked about at the uh, convention some about you know how the process is going to work. But quite frankly, we need to be smart. We don't have an unlimited amount of resources to, to use on putting Republicans in office. And we need to be smart about how we spend those dollars. So I think that's coming forward out of the out of the, at the Republican side, and I would encourage anybody here that, to think of really think about where you spend your dollars or send your dollars. I would recommend highly that we use those on Republican versus Democrat instead of Republican versus Republican, because at the end of the day, you can have the most perfect Republican you want in Sacramento, but if he can't accomplish anything, it doesn't matter. We need to have numbers, because even with the 25 we have. You won't get, on any given day, 10 of us to all agree that we need to move in the right direction. So it's very difficult to try to get 25 of us all going the same way. So I need another 15 so I can get to it. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I need another more, the more numbers, the better off we are. So I wanted to just open up with that because I think that's one of the most important things for the party itself in this next uh, go-around cycle. And, and on top of that, we have the ability to be there for 12 years. You're going to have legislators in office for some time, which I think is a good thing. 
The average time frame for an assembly member under the six year term cycle was 3.8 years. In 3.8 years, you can't do, get to know your job, get really good staff, and get something done. Most legislators aren't going to be able to do that. I happen to be lucky. I served 16 years on a board of supervisors where I have some background in doing policy. But for a lot of these members, it's a real change because they came out of an area where they don't have that legislative experience. So I think that the 12-year term limits are going to be great for California. It gives them stability. Gives people to become experts in their field and other members rely on them. With that being said, I wanted to say, you know, my first year in office, uh, I think I, I did a, a, a great job. We got some legislation passed I want to talk about in a little bit. But I want to just uh, kind of give you my philosophy on when I went to Sacramento, what was the things that uh, I focused on, and that was to bring members to my district. You know, we talk about the North State, we talk, and I represent 25,000 square miles of California. So I represent a lot of the water, a lot of the timber, a lot of the used to be mining, uh, hunting, all the natural resources things are, are a lot of my district. So I have members who uh, have never been, some of the members have never been north of the Sacramento Airport. And we took uh, nine of them up into Siskiyou County. We went through a lumber, uh, a plywood mill. We took them out in the forest. We talked about forestry. Um, those are the type of things that I'm trying to get members out of the district. We had a, a tour up here to Nevada County. We went to the uh, Empire Mine. We went and looked at a fire break. We went out to, I can't remember. Say it. Coggy. And looked at the, uh, the silt coming in behind the reservoir there. So with those, huh? Fair River. So, I'm sorry, I got a lot of district. I know a lot of parts of it, but I don't know every dam and every, and I know the main rivers, but I don't know every single uh, you know, spot in the whole district. I, and I hope to get to know it. I hope to get a member from the legislature out there, and together we can learn. But with the, the, my, my goal was is to, I, I threw out the, to them, I, if you'll come to my district, I'll go to your district. Because really, at the end of the day, it's about relationships. Whether it doesn't matter your political background, obviously there are some things, I mean, that the Republicans and Democrats are never going to get along, but there are a lot of things that we agree on. And we all want clean water, we all want a good forest, we all want jobs, I and mean, those are all things they talk, that we talk about wanting, so let's work on some of those things and not, not sit there and beat our heads against these, the wall at each other um, on the things we disagree with. So by doing that, we were able to get nine members uh, into the district. And uh, we gave them a tour. We took them out, like I said. And um, so at the end of the session, I, I didn't, you know, if you guys remember when I campaigned, I, I don't think we need any more laws. I think we have too many laws. And I'm in business. I, I, I don't want any more regulation. I don't want any more laws. I, I got enough to deal with as that is. So I only carried a couple of bills. We carried uh, three bills and, um, and a couple of ADRs, which was uh, an ADR is a assembly joint resolution, which basically is, uh, you know, it could be. Uh, breast Cancer Awareness Month, it can be, but mine were to urge Congress to uh, reauthorize the rural, rural, secure rural schools funding for our rural schools. So I have a couple of ADRs, but anyway, uh, I got the, I got a, all my bills except for one that I'm still working on um, that is a two-year bill signed into law. And so I'm very excited about it. <laughs> And along with getting those bills signed, I also got a 100% rating from the California Taxpayers Association. One of 14 members in the whole 120. So, and I give a lot of credit to Sherry. I cannot tell you how blessed I am to have um, a 14-year veteran in the, in, the, in the Capitol to go to work for me. It's, uh, she's a, my ledge director, and we sit down, the two of us, and we go through all these bills thousands of bills and you know there's some of them we read the first two paragraphs and we don't have to read any further because we know that's an absolute no <laughs> like um, all these gun legislation ones those are easy for us I think there was one that I voted on I voted yes on I think it was a child block or something but anyway it's hard and it's very hard to keep track of someone comes to me and go hey bill number 122 AB I have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> because there's thousands of them, and there's AB1X and AB1. So anyway, so it's helpful if you're going to talk to me, you need to give me a chance to digest it and actually 
sit down with Sherry and, and get back to you on it. But uh, back to uh, my legislation. So I did submit some bills. I did a bill for Modoc County. It was my first bill. It was an elections bill. <clears throat> Nine other counties had already did what I asked the legislature to do. It went out unanimous. The governor signed it. Um, it basically helps the elections, helps the county save money, and it was a, was a no-brainer bill. The, the second bill I had was a, an, a, it's a bill that you're going to see when you uh, when you go to the polls. It's, a, it's an elections bill, and this bill basically, one of the things I was very frustrated with, right, with as, a, as a county supervisor is when you go out and gather signatures to get something put on the ballot, that's because you're usually frustrated that, that, that the legislature didn't put it on the ballot, right? And so, but then a lot of times the legislature will put something on the ballot and there's no distinction between who got signatures and who and, and which uh, legislative body put it on the ballot. So the general public out there thinks, wow, somebody went out and gathered signatures so the people really must be, you know, this is a grassroots operation. So my bill says it will be on there who put the legislation up, whether it's the team party or whether it's the California Taxpayers Association, whether it's the assembly, whether it's the county board of supervisors, the, the water district, it will define who put it on there. So I think that's a key picture. Because really, that's good policy, right? You, the voter needs to be informed on who's doing what to them. And a lot of times you'll have the, the people will gather the signatures and then the legislators don't like what they gathered up to put on there. So they'll put a competing a measure of against your measure, right? And confuse the words. So that's really, hopefully, I'm hoping that the voter will understand why we try to clarify that form at the polls. So that will come on your sample ballot, you'll be able to read it, and hopefully it will educate you a bit. The, the, the last bill I uh, got to law was a, an exciting bill for me. It was uh, 8744. I'll give you a number this morning if you remember. <laughs> so um, if you recall, I mentioned earlier about the uh, uh, bringing the legislators up, and uh, so I got a tip from. I want, to, I want to talk for a second before I get into the bill a little bit about the dynamics of, of Sacramento. So there's 54 Democrats and 25. There should be 55, but there's one missing right now. But anyway, there's 54 Democrats. Not all the Democrats are marching to the same drum. They don't all get along. Quite frankly, there are personality issues on their side, just like there are on our own. And, and so, um, I learned that, you know, and, and they're, they're, some of those people are very powerful people. They run committees, and, and if you have a bill and they don't like your bill, it's not going to see the daylight when it gets out of your out of committee. So, you know, it's, it's trying to figure out how you're going to negotiate through the process if you're going to try to actually get something done. So I want to just disclose one thing right out of the gate. I am not a legislator who's going to run a bill that is not going to, that doesn't have a chance of getting out. Just to go back to my district and say, I sponsored legislation that, and make you feel good that I sponsored legislation that I know is not going to get out of committee. That to me is a waste of taxpayer money because it costs money to print all that stuff for all the staff in the year, and the bill is not going to go anywhere. So I want to actually be successful in the legislation that I'm trying to run. With that being said, we go back to about how many days was it before the election? Or before the end of the session? Six? Six days before the session, one of my Democrat friends says to me, you should run a, a, a timber bill because I've had them out in the district. They know I'm passionate about doing something about the fires we're having in the state. So I'm thinking, six days left? You, there's the deadline's passed months ago in February. You can't even put a bill in. Well, there's a, a process to basically hijack somebody else's bill, put your language in it, and do it. They do it all the time. They do it all the time. There's bills that they do right on the floor that we don't have even seen very much information about. So I went to Sherry and I'm like, hey, I got a tip, maybe we should try to run a timber bill, which would be good, to, which I've talked about for some time, and so we're like trying to figure out how to do it. So anyway, make a long story short, Bridge Gordon, who came up here, actually has a home here somewhere, and was on one of my tours, had a bill in natural resources that was 744 was the bill. And it was um, in the perfect committee for me to be able to go and uh, move my legislation. So I went and asked Rich, I said, hey, I want to kind of ask you a question. I hijacked your bill. And he's, he's kind of laughed, what are you going to do? 
we had six days before, yet there's not much time to get anything done. So I said, I want to run a timber bill. And he said, so I told him what I wanted to do, and he said, heck, I'll just co-author with you. How's that sound? <laughs> so now you got Democrat, Republican. We make a long story short, we were opposed by the Sierra Club at every step of the way, and we ended up getting the bill to the assembly, and it was 11.45, it came up, and 12 o'clock is the deadline for the, uh, the legislature. <laughs> And I got a, uh, I introduced the bill on the floor, and I got 75 yes votes and one no vote. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's exciting to know that um, 7, 8744 is the bill. Let me tell you what it does. That's the best question. <laughs> so there, Doug Moffa ran a bill. They called it the Moffa Exemption, actually. And it allowed you, as a private landowner, to uh, reduce the fuel on your property trees up to 18 inches without doing a timber harvest plan. Okay, so this, this bill increased the diameter to 24 inches. So you could go. Now, here's the issue with um, is that it costs a lot of money to do a timber harvest plan, and there's no return back for most landowners. 18 inches is not a very big tree, and you have all these little trees you have to remove, which cost a ton of money. So it ends up costing, in, uh, in most cases, for a landowner to do good forestry and make their fire, their forest, uh, you know, resistant to fire, or not resistant, but let the fire get down on the floor where it belongs and naturally. You know, we've been putting out forest fires for 60 years. Forest fires naturally we did the weeding of our forest. When, when we were here, lightning strike, it burned for months sometimes, but it burned low, cool, and to the floor. And that's why they left all these big trees, was because the fire wasn't as intense. Now, you have an intense fire because you have so many trees. We used to have 200 trees per acre, we have 2,000 trees, which, by the way, are all sucking water out of the ground, mm -hmm. getting stressed. The bugs fight them. Mm -hmm. They can't defend off the bugs, and they die, and lightning strikes, we have catastrophic events. We have water quality issues, we have air quality issues. So, Quite frankly, what I explained to most of my friends on the other side and Republicans who didn't understand what I was doing is that if you truly care about global warming, which is you know the topic number one down there, a growing forest, one that's alive, sequesters carbon, right? One that's dying and burning emits carbon. So what do we want? We want a live forest that sequesters carbon, allows us we want the canopy to be opened up, which allows the snow to get to the floor of the forest where it can recharge our groundwater. It's not laying up in the lands evaporating as the wind blows every day. So I just did those simple things, the same things we do on the farm. We weed the, anything that I plant in my field that I didn't put there is a weed. Right? I want only the seeds that I put in the field to grow. So same basic concept, but with forestry. So we, I made that pitch and we got 75 yes votes to one no vote. So those are the things that um, I want to continue to work on is building those relationships, educating, and um, you know, I always say, my wife thinks this is very corny, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So I will be, I will be at, and I don't care what party you're from, what race you are, what religion you are, I don't care anybody that stuff. If you, you and I can agree on something that's going to better California, I will work with you on it. So I get a lot of criticism from some of my Tea Party folks about, you know, I talk to liberals and, and people who don't think like us, and that's absolutely correct, I do, and I will continue to. Because, look, we need to unify. America's a great place. I love this country, I love this state. The difference between me and a lot of people is I own land. We homestead it in this state. I can't pick it up and leave, so I've got to fix the things that are wrong here now. And we can do that. You know, one man can make a difference. I'm just one assembly member, but I have convinced 75 people to vote for my bill with the Sierra Club opposing Now that says to me that we can do a lot by opening those doors, continuing to broaden our education base, being friendly, and actually listening more than you talk. So since I've been talking all the time, it's my turn to listen now, and I want to um, listen to you. So I just want to, real quick, let you know, I let you know that I got 100% on the tax, um, California Taxpayers Association. Um, I also voted against all the gun legislation except for the one that was really sad to see the late ammunition passed. 
I don't think it's that. I don't think it's going to help the environment no. um, like they say it is, and it's really going to impact folks who shoot because there's no alternative out there that really works. Good. If there was an alternative out there that works as good as lead, we would all be doing it. But um, it's really going to impact the cost of the ammunition for the state and for people who um, enjoy to use their firearms. So those are the, the few things I just wanted to let out there, and I will continue to um, promote jobs. That's the number one thing. You know, we have a lot of um, people who talk about, you know, California's back on track. The only reason we have had the legislature shut down and passed the budget is because we raised taxes on the richest people in the state, and, that's, and that was only good for seven years. My concern is, is that they're used to spending that money, and I know government, once they take it, they never give it back. So we need to create jobs. We need a job market. Regulation is number one thing that causes business people not to do it. And California is regulated more than any other state. So I will continue to work on those issues that help uh, business people stay in business and actually and hopefully make, make it so they'll want to hire somebody at some point. So with that, I'm going to open up a question. I need to grab a drink of water and then I'll take your question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, first question. Did your Bill 744 get through the Senate and get signed by the governor? Yes. Okay, great. We got 26 to 5 in the Senate, and um, the governor signed it to the 8th. It's law. Fantastic. That's the timber. Enlarges, allows private landowners to harvest timber up to 25 inches without doing a timber harvest plan. Okay, the second question. How do we get rid of laws and regulations? It's a great question. So, I, I would say this. That, that's something that, uh, you know, we are doing some. There, there was some, actually, in my opinion, some great bills that were authored by Democrats that we passed. There was a bill, Prop 65, are you familiar with that? That's the one where you go into a, a, a restaurant that says, these chemicals are known to cause cancer, and there's a little plaque, and there's a whole bunch of them, and there's so many of them you don't even read them. But there was a lot of attorneys going around suing businesses because the size of the plaque wasn't the right size or it wasn't placed in the right place. We passed a law that said the business has 15 to 30 days to be able to rectify it without being sued by these groups. So those are the type of things that are good for business. And as far as repealing laws, I'm, I was a freshman, so I didn't get too aggressive, but um, I have a whole list of things that I'm going to be uh, working on. And, I'm, and quite frankly, I'm not. I'm going to go speak with my, the, find out what committees I'm going to have to go through, and then speak to the committee members and see if they're willing to. you got to get out of committee first. There's legislators that have been there four years, or, or on their third year, who had never been had a bill to the floor. I did that in the first week. Well, my bill wasn't a very big bill. I mean, the one from Modoc County wasn't a huge, it wasn't a controversy, but some members they just don't like, and they, they kill their bills out of committee. So the goal is to first get it out of committee, and then get it to the floor, and then you got to go through the same process in the Senate. So I'm going to work with those committee members to educate them on what the issues are, how I'm trying to fix it, and then we'll move that. That's the process I want to use. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> I probably don't really need this, but uh, it probably helps for those in the back. Um, something that's really been bothering me is when we try to find out how different representatives, Senate or legislature, vote in California, we haven't been able to find any place that just has them listed. Is there something like that around, that, or can we work on it if there is not? I don't know that question either, so I'm looking at my life track here. <laughs> I know that, um, I think there's got to be some places posted. I mean, I've had people call me up and get on me about, you know, voting for a certain, I voted, was one of three Republicans that voted for the fracking bill. So I got a lot, I got some agreement about that. But I, I, I don't know if I take a question, I'll just explain that vote for real quickly. So there was, a, there was nine bills to, to regulate fracking, and all of them died except for SB4. And um, so SB4 basically said we want to have, we want to know what they're putting in the ground. We, we need to know what chemical they're putting chemicals in the ground to, to extract the oil. And do I say that's wrong? If it's water, I don't care. But I don't know what they're putting down. There. 
So my thing for me is I'm for fracking. They've been doing it for 60 years. It's a good process, but they've been, there's, they've, they've changed it up now. They can frack different ways, and they're putting stuff in the ground that we aren't aware of. So for me, it's about the water. So in the north, we have great water in the north state, and they've already had some contaminations in the in the Central Valley with nitrates from fertilizers and dairies and what have you. So my thing is, is we should know what they're putting in the groundwater, so at least we can monitor it. And second of all, if they screw up their groundwater, where do you think they're going to come to get their water? It's going to be in the north. So I'm concerned that we know, you know, what's going on with the fracking people. So. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to. I, I tried to look online with the state website, and there were, um, it was the, the bills, and they were listed by numbers, but it was, you know, when you're in session and you actually vote, I couldn't find, and that's what we were discussing, couldn't find any way to specifically say, they were in session, they voted, what did they vote on this week or this month? That was where we, and so maybe we can get something, I'd like to get it on our website and help us. I, I know that, uh, one of the, I think it was a Placer County Tea Party people went back and went through all, every single legislator's vote and scored every one of them in the last election cycle. Yeah, so I know there's a way to get them. We'll, we'll just have to figure out how to do that. And it would be accessible to the Yes. Yeah. Uh, Legendfo is a website that the state basically maintains. You can go in there and look up bills. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know the bill number, you can look up that bill and you can go to a votes tab and it'll actually tell you how everybody voted. As far as just a uh, overview of what bills uh, individual members voted for, there's really not, the caucus maintains some things, but I don't believe that's for public record. I think that's an internal document that they do just for us. So Legendo is, is your number one source for the state stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's where we were going. And yeah. It's hard to see what's happening now. Like, you've been there a year. What did you do? Um, what did uh, Well, you can look up individual do? members and it'll bring up, you know, like their own particular bills. It won't bring up anything else as far as all the bills they voted on. Or how they like Everybody voted on all the bills. Well, so, <coughs> I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get your card and maybe I'll tell everyone here that. Thank you. <laughs> could you tell us how we could be most effective in an action way when bills are coming up? Is it important for us to show up there, write letters? Does that make a difference or not? What, what can we do? That is a really good question. Um, for me, and I'm just going to be straight up front here, it doesn't influence my vote one bit if I get 10,000 calls or one. Because, and I say that respectfully, but, you know, I had, one day I had 2,700 calls from my district opposing the fracking bill from the Sierra, well, it was mostly people who are, were, uh, I think it was Sierra Club that put out the flyer, they were opposed to it. So I had 2,700 calls. You know, and I and I took some of them. I, I happened to be. We were in session uh, late. We were working on our bill, and it was like 6:30 at night. And the phone rang, and I answered. You know, and they go, well, you know, first of all, they can't believe somebody answered the phone. <laughs> I answered the phone, and I said, "This is Cindy Medalli. How can I help you?" And they go, uh, uh, "Well, we we want to oppose SB4." And I said, "Why are you opposing the bill? We don't like cracking." I said, "There are no other bills. This is the only bill." that is going to do any regulatory on fracking. Other than that, it's going to be the same as it is. Or we're opposed to this. So I got into dialogue. So I ended up learning that they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Somebody sent them a thing to tell them, call in and vote. And, you know, so you're a number, basically. So for me, yes, I want to hear from my constituents that live in my district, but I hope I hear about it, um, you know, when the bill, uh, you know, I, that I know where you're at before long before. And if there's, a, there's, a, there's some very controversial bills that I mean I really had to think hard about, but there was about as many people that I respected on both sides of those issues, on both sides of those issues. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. Bill had a bill, this, is a, this was a very tough bill, so it, allowed, it was a bill to um, penalize the Catholic Church for um, allowing, not helping on your, how do I, basically, 
the trial attorneys were going to go after the Catholic Church for sweeping under sexual uh, assaults to juveniles, and the statute of limitations had closed. So, you know, do I hate, do I dislike trial attorneys? Yes. Do I dislike sexual predators? Yeah, just a little bit more. So, you know, it's like, but it was a tough bill. I mean, it was one of those where you sit down and you go, man, either way you go, it's really, just wasn't a great bill. You, you know, you're either going to sit it out and not do anything, or you're going to stand up and count. Sometimes I lay off the bill because there's, they're really split down the middle. There's good in the bill and bad in the bill, and I can't really go either against it. So I sit those ones out, and I don't vote on them because they're just, they're just that way. So there were some really tough issues. But as far as answering the question that you asked me, yes, I want to hear from my constituents because I want to make sure that I'm not getting too far out of the out of the weeds. But I should know that from doing this already. But yes, it doesn't hurt to shoot an email and and um, and really to be honest with you my ledge my ledge staff will say, hey you got fifth you got a hundred calls on this bill. And I'll say, what were they saying? So that the bill on the you know the Catholic Church was really adamant about trying to stop that bill. And so I got a lot of calls on that one bill. When I was undecided, so it helps, but I'm still going to go to my core and go, okay, what's best because for the people? And, and another thing, too, that's really interesting about being, in, and I, I learned this as a board of question, is that, you know, the, the constituency doesn't always have all the information. It's just like when you were talking about, you know, our congressman voting, we have no idea the politics behind what's going on back there. Unless you're right, you have to trust them. And you, and you hopefully have that trust from, you know, a relationship with them. But yes, it does help, but I'm not going to say that it's going to sway me to, you know, because I had 10,000 calls, there's 470,000 people out there that didn't call me. And I always maintain that there's a silent majority. There's a, there's, I mean, I remember my board of supervisors meeting, there was six people that showed up every week and was fired up about everything. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you guys have all probably witnessed that they're there, and I don't know what else they had to do, but they were there. But there's there's 10,000 people that didn't show up that are just as passionate about. So you have to so you have to know where your district's at and do the right thing. So I'm not going to say that it doesn't help, but it it, it really helped. I mean, if somebody from another district calls me, I know they're just trying to sway me. But I really focus on my district, so I I, I can tell if it comes from my district. So. But I, then I, then I, if I get 20, like I got 2,700 calls that one day, I wonder what they're calling me about. Is it all the same issue? Yes. What are they saying? Now I know that somebody sent, some organization sent out an email blast and said, call your legislator. I have a question, Brian. Okay. Uh, I think what I'm hearing you say is you have basic, strong principles that you believe in. Right. And that's what governs and informs your vote. Uh, my question has to do with CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, and I had read a while ago that Governor Brown was interested in revising it. Can you give us some idea of whether or not that is happening, and if it were happening, what direction would you want it to go? That's a very great question, and I, first of all, I want to say this about CEQA, which is going to probably blow you out of the water, but CEQA is a good piece of legislation. When it was originally, am I doing that? When it was originally crafted, it was to basically inform your neighbors that something's going to happen next to you. And but what's happened to CEQA is that environmental groups, businesses have used CEQA, and unions have used CEQA to as a tool to extract money or to stop their opponent from doing something. Now I'm going to give you an example. At the local level, you may have one construction company over here, and one over here, one owns a gravel pit that's existing, and another one wants to put a gravel pit in over here. Well, this competition for these guys, so what do they do? They get somebody to, to litigate them under CEQA. So they litigate them into where it's not, there's not enough profit in it now to do it. Unions use it in the fact that they go out and go, if you don't do a private labor agreement with us and we're going to have all union workers on there, we're going to litigate you under CEQA. Environmental groups use it for their issues. 
So really, the law of CEQA is not a bad law, and I and I think it's a it was originally intended to do make good policy and inform the public of what is happening in their neighborhood. But it's been used as a tool. So yes, the governor and everybody in business knows that CEQA is a hurdle to get over if you want to do anything. And not all other states have CEQA. So I'm very much into modifying. I'd like to see some parameters put on the legislature, the, the uh, judicial part of how CEQA was used as a tool. I don't know if that will ever happen. Probably not. But yes, I am totally in favor of working with CEQA, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to happen. I, I, yeah. If I may, I have a question. Wait, let me finish my thought on CEQA. <laughs> quite, quite frankly, CEQA is, if, there, if you see something happen with CEQA, it will not be huge. It may be a huge press release and, hey, we fixed the business part of CEQA, but I will tell you right now, it will, it will not be huge. And it will be done uh, as a tool to just say we did something. I don't think you'll see, and this is just my opinion, I don't think you'll see a uh, huge substantial change that will help business to see. My, more than a question, maybe it's a comment. In my years in business, I get to deal with a number of stakeholders. <laughs> just, just turn that off if I can hear you. Okay. Um, stakeholders that seem to have a life of their own are created. Uh, my perfect example is the Air Quality Control Board, which seems to be totally independent, doing their thing. Building the buildings in Los Angeles, driving the furniture industry out of Los Angeles into Tijuana, and what who controls that for? So do they have a life? Excellent question. Okay, so I'm the vice chair of Toxics and Environment, and so the, the, the Department of Toxics. So legislation. Let me just tell you real quick. AB 32, the Global Warming Bill, which is uh, mitigated by uh, or operated by the. the uh, EPA. Yeah, EPA. Uh, Mary Mills. So basically, and Department of Toxic Substance, the legislature, bipartisan legislature, passed this, this legislation that basically said, we're going to pass off the implementation of regulations to the departments and the bureaucrats. You want to know why? Is because they didn't want to sit in a committee meeting. And this is my opinion. They didn't want to sit in a committee meeting and listen to two scientists battle over what's in Windex for two hours in a committee meeting and trying to figure out what they're going to do about it. So they basically said, "We're going to pass those implementation of those laws to Department of Toxic Substances." Same thing with AB 32. And so, if there's one thing that I do across the spectrum in Sacramento, when you when the legislators or, okay, their, their constituents are mad about some implementation of the law. It's our own fault because we gave the power to the bureaucrats. I say to them, bring the power back to the person who's responsible, which is us. We're responsible to you. And if we pass it off to somebody else, then that's our fault. So I continually say that in Sacramento. Bring the power back to the legislature. So when your constituents or your businesses are mad, you can do something about it. And so, quite frankly, right now, it was bipartisan legislation, and they're implementing that stuff without any oversight of the legislature, which is, in my opinion, totally wrong. So, and that was a bipartisan legislation. A lot of Republicans voted for that legislation, and it was quite some time ago. So, you're just, I'm just as frustrated as you are when it comes to that, because I think that's wrong. At the County Board of Supervisors, we had public hearings, and I sat through hours and hours of debate but I tell you what, I know a lot about some subdivisions in Lassen County. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Make friends with this. I'd like to thank you and your wife for going down and helping with antibiotics and walking the precincts. Um, I did a lot of phone calls, and I want to thank other people in the room that also rallied behind the phones. And I'd like to encourage people um, to go to the Secretary of State's website and start being aware of what special elections are coming up, what candidates are coming up for election that isn't during the primary that's off-season. And vet out who it is. And if they're with 
the Republican Party contacts the Central Committee here in our county and get engaged with the local phone calling people or the Libertarian, whatever, do something on the phone. Phone callers are so important. In fact, I helped Lonigan in New Jersey with phone call banking. You can do it at home and get dialed in, and it's a one way of putting our boots in the ground and making your own choice as a voter, but engaging and trying to get more elected officials in Brian's camp in California as well as across the nation. So please, keep yourself informed. Also, I'm a big mouth, I'll always tell you what else is going on too, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to say that, it, it, you know, the state's a very big state, there's 36 million people here, and a Republican in Lassen County is different than a Republican from Orange County. So, but I'll take the Republican, even if he's from wherever, but I, you know, I just need numbers at this point. And, you know, we're not all, we don't, we don't all think the same and thank God that we don't because we would just, you know, would be interesting. But we need to try to get somebody that agrees with you, you know, hopefully 99% of the time. But if they only agree with you 8% of the time and they're still there, that 80% would be a lot better than somebody who agrees with me about 2% of the time, which is the majority of those people in the, in the assembly. So I would take an 80% all day over somebody that's going to give me maybe two or three percent of their of their time or even care. So I I look at things a little different. I think you know that we are I think things are going to change in California. I think that um, we're going to move uh, because of the 12 years and I think the open primary changes the dynamics in, in the uh, Senate. I know that you, you really dislike that but I want to I want to just shed a little light on the open primary. You know, I went through the process and not that I think that, but when you think about this, you know, I know that a lot of people think the open primary doesn't give you a good conservative candidate. But think about this. There's 54 Democrats that are in office and Democrat seats that are, that are, that are highly swayed. You're going to get a Democrat out of those seats. A lot of those seats aren't very close. A lot of them are big point spreads. So what happened in the, in the, Democrat primary, when it was a closed primary, is you had to out left the left guy, which is the same thing we had, but we had to out right the right guy. Right? So think about that. So you had the way to the right, because all you had to do was get to the primary and you're in, because it's a Republican district. All they had to do was get to the primary and be the left leftist guy. So what happened when you got to the legislature? You had way to the right and extremes on both sides. They never speak to each other. This guy never had to listen to the, any Republicans in his district, and this guy never had to listen to any Democrats in his district. Now, you're going to have 54. you got 25 over here that are, are in Republican districts. you got 54 of them that have to pay attention to Republicans in their district because they can run a Democrat who's not as left as them against them. So it's going to bring, really, it's going to bring the electorate at the state, in my opinion, it's going to bring it closer to where a lot of the people are and actually force you to have to listen to somebody because if you are just going to sit out there and talk to your base of small people on both sides, it's, it's going to change. And, you know, the legislators, I mean, the freshmen, or the sophomores and seniors that are there now say, man, the freshman class is really laid back. We have 12 years. There's no big hurry to go out and get your name out there, run a bunch of bills because you're going to want to take your senator out in a few years. Really, the idea is to, you got 12 years if you, if your people keep you there, but you have time to actually do policies, which we're supposed to do, and not, not drive an agenda that is going to just get your name in the paper and not actually accomplish anything for your people. So I think the open primary, it is what it is. And I know that some are very wound up about it, but it works the same on the other side. You're not going to see as many way to the left guys because they can't they got to talk to them. And especially in those districts where it's 55 to 45. There's not a very far spread right now you really have to talk to most everybody. I mean, yes sir. Last question. You got it sir. 
Thank you again so much. We really appreciate it. 